Good evening, welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, the student edition. My name is Jasmine Gracia. I'm a student fellow for the EPCC UTEP Humanities Collaborative, and today I'm having a dialogue with Dr. Barbara Zimbalist. Dr. Barbara Zimbalist is a medievalist specializing in the vernacular religious tech literature of England, France, and the Low Countries. She received her PhD from the University of California, Davis, in May of 2013. She has published articles and book chapters on Middle English devotional literature and Anglo-Norman saints' lives. In addition to her primary research interests in high and late medieval religious cultures, she also pursues research in manuscript studies and book history and intersection of critical theory and medieval studies. She recently published a book this spring titled The Translation of Christ in the Middle Ages, which focuses on women's visionary text and their roles within medieval discourse, authorship, reading, and devotion. Hi, Dr. Zimbalist. Yes. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you for having me. I'm <laughs> really excited to have okay. a conversation. I hope you like my questions. Okay. Yeah. So first question is, as a higher institute educator, has there been a hindrance in the physical structure of the classroom that you've learned to overcome? And what environmental challenges as an educator have you experienced? That is such a good question. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you again for inviting me, Jasmine. It's really, it's always fun to talk with you. And I'm really pleased that we're going to get a chance to talk about teaching today because that's one of the ways in which I know you. And mm -hmm. um, this is, it's been really nice to have you as a repeat student in my class. Yeah, and, so and also I think, next semester. Yeah, <laughs> so I feel like we have, we have like a shared background now. Um, and so I know your questions are coming from a place of experience as well as um, of curiosity. So I would say a challenge that I have found in the physical layout of, um, like just really of the classroom, is that sometimes I will be <laughs> given classrooms like the one we're in this semester, where the desks are completely immovable, right? And people kind of tend to get stuck because of the physical layout of a class. And in a way, what I'm talking about is really kind of a, like a bigger kind of, um, a kind of meta stuckness, not just that they come in and they sit at the same desk every day, but that as a result of coming in and sitting at the same desk every day, they tend to kind of gravitate toward talking to the same people every day mm -hmm. or having like the same habits throughout the class every day. And then people can kind of get into a rut, which it may be, a, it's prompted by a physical, like environmental um, situation, but then it, it can become a little bit intellectual or even a little bit um, behavioral in the way that you interact with the class and your classmates. So one of the ways that I have you know, occasionally tried to change that is, um, you know, I think because they're college students, sometimes, you know, our students, they, they, they kind of just kind of get into their mode and they think that they're just going to do that. So I kind of remind them that no matter what level we're at, like we're in a classroom that requires you to engage. And so I've literally, you know, I've numbered people off. I've made them get up and mm -hmm. move around. I, um, I do a lot of making students like get up out of their seats and come up and write their own work on the board so that we can discuss it as a group. Um, because I find that you move the body, you move the mind, right, and vice versa. So you have to be um, able to get people out of their comfort zone to achieve any kind of good conversation and learning. With the, with the group element, since you said you kind of move students around and number them off, have you seen like a different production of like the work and like can you kind of uh, pinpoint like the students like thought process in the work when they move around different groups because they're not stuck to the yes, same group? absolutely. So I find I usually start doing that about a, you know a third of the way into the semester when people have gotten comfortable where they are and they tend to work with the same people and then I'll observe that in the same little groups that form every time the same person will always be doing the writing the same person will be doing kind of the majority maybe of the legwork for whatever the set of questions is that day or the bigger assignment so when I force people to switch it up and work with people they don't know um, then suddenly they may take on a different role in the group or be forced to you know once again get out of their comfort zone be the person who volunteers to say something because maybe suddenly you were the shy person in your old group and now everyone else in your new group is shyer than you and you have, you have to speak or the other way around right suddenly other people have a lot more to say than you and you have to figure out how to balance that conversation so i think all those kinds of their physical um physical features of the space we learn and um and have conversations in, it affects the way that we learn and then we have to respond back to that. So, yeah. Yeah, I kind of, um, with, uh, I've always wondered like if when you move it around the students, like if you can see like their mental processes kind of like shifting and stuff like that. You kind of already answered this question, but it says, as an educator, have you seen a pattern of students who choose to sit at the front versus the back and the participation? And how does seating arrangements kind of create stereotypes for you and like what to expect yes, from students? 100%, so it is, 
often the case um, that people who sit at the back for whatever reason are not big talkers in class. They may be shy, they may have, um, I've had students that have, you know, um, had a speech impediment, say, and are really uncomfortable um, talking in class. Um, and then the stereotype, of course, is that those in the front are going to be raising their hand and have a lot to say, and that's, you know, often the case. But then there's also other reasons that people might sit in the front, like maybe they don't see very well <laughs> and they want to see the board, right? Um, I've actually had students say, you know, I'm sitting in the front, but it's really because of my glasses, you know, and I hope you don't call me all the time. Or <laughs> So I actually, that's one of the reasons that I, I try to have so much group work in my classes, because I don't want people to get too comfortable always being in one place, although people do tend to gravitate. I've also tried this semester, you may remember at the very beginning of the term, I tried the index card method, right, <laughs> which was had everybody write their name on a card and then instead of calling people just, you know, from wherever I could see them in the room, I would literally just go through my list. My, my, I was flipping through the index cards and I just went person I don't by person. See you doing that. I stopped doing about halfway through okay. because then I had learned everyone's names okay. and by that time everyone knew it didn't matter where they sat. I was going <laughs> to call on you. But yeah, people get a little... They get a little too comfortable based on where they are because they think, oh, I won't be called on until halfway through or, you know, if I say something, you know, in the first part of the class, I won't get called on again. And I think it's really good to just shake up those expectations because you learn best when you're actively thinking ahead because, you know, you may be called on at any moment. <laughs> As a professor, like versus the high school setting, I guess, since you're, all, you're relegated to one singular classroom versus like in this one, since you're the one moving, how does that affect like your teaching? Since are you always in Hudspeth or do you like move around? Oh, yeah, we're always in, we're almost always in Hudspeth. Mm -hmm. I've taught in a lot of different um, classrooms. Um, for my big undergraduate classes, I mean big in the sense of for the English department, our biggest class is 36. So of course that's very different than psychology where they have 250 person lectures right in Psych 101. Um, but I, I mean, I love that we have even our bigger classes have a cap that allow a group discussion, right? Um, so, you know, I teach either um, in kind of our biggest room 100, which has some stadium seating, which I actually really love that room because, because people are on a slant like this, I can see everybody and I can see who's on their phone or I can call on people that are doodling. Um, but then um, in my graduate seminars, we have like smaller seminar table rooms and I really love that because then everybody's sitting around the table and we really have a more of a conversation. So it's more intimate in yeah. way versus like the grand scale of the seating arrangements? Yeah, mm. absolutely. How has teaching evolved to integrate students of different backgrounds? Oh, that's, that's such a good and it's a hard question, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, when I started teaching, I was finishing, well, I was in my master's degree. I was 25, so I was not a whole lot older than a lot of my students. Mm -hmm. And so I shared a lot with my students at the beginning. Um, you know, I had gone to college, my parents had not. I, um, I was putting myself through school, you know, I was working and going to school. It took me eight years to get my BA. <laughs> so I had a lot of shared experiences with the students um, at the state school where I was, um, where I started teaching, student teaching. And that was really powerful because we had different cultural backgrounds, but we shared a lot of the same socioeconomic background. And that became kind of a, a meeting point because I think from the very beginning of my teaching career, because I was a person that worked and went to school for most of my time um, throughout my BA and my MA, less so in my PhD because that was really specialized. But um, I understood what it meant to be a working student because I had been one. And so, you know, I understand that all of us, right, are you know, the classroom is one aspect of what we're doing, and then there's a lot of an interconnected parts of our lives. And so, you know, that has just, I've tried to keep that as my guiding principle, right? Even as I've moved, as I've gotten older, but my students have remained in their early 20s, <laughs> um, you know, I realize I may not be able to be meeting them, you know, on the same kind of, you know, we're not the same generation anymore. But I still, you know, I still had certain experiences as a student. I still moved around a lot. Um, but I also, you know, I, when I came to El Paso, I had a really different student demographic, diff people of different backgrounds. And so one of the things that has helped me engage with that aspect of my students' lives is to invite them to bring that to bear on their work, right? Um, and one of the ways that I do that most centrally in all of my classes, I think, as you know, is that a lot of the texts that I read, I mean, they're medieval texts, they're written before the 15th century, right? Um, especially when we read things from, you know, that have been translated out of Old English or, you know, Anglo-Norman French. Um, so many of our students here in El Paso speak more than one language, right? And they're translators every moment of every day of their lives. And so thinking about the texts that we read have all always been translated before they hit 
you know, our desks. I like that. Is a way that we can start to have those conversations that bring our, sh our different but also shared backgrounds together in the classroom. While you were studying, uh, like the transition from like, your bachelor's to your master's to your PhD, how was like the transition from when you were a student and your experiences in the classroom shaped your kind of like teaching methods? When I was an undergraduate doing my BA, I was the person who was always in the front row raising my hand. Um, but I kind of grew into that student as I, as I got, you know, further along in my English degree. And at the beginning, I was more shy. Um, and I think, you know, I still remember that I had friends of every, you know, comfort level. And so I, I realize every time I step into a classroom, I'm going to have a group of students on the whole spectrum of, you know, willingness to talk, but also that many students often simply aren't sure quite where to enter the conversation. So I try to come up with different ways to join in, right? To have, like, there are days when, as you know, I painfully force every <laughs> single person in class to read something they've written out loud. And that may seem tedious, but it might be the first time some people have spoken all semester, right? And it can be like a little bit of a gateway, right? Suddenly they've said something and it's somebody might dating. say something mm -hmm. to them, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then maybe next time they'll speak up more. So I think that that's part of my job, is to make people realize that the conversation can only gain when you join it. I like that, and that's a great segue, because I was going to ask, have you always taught in a discussion-oriented manner? And if not, when did this begin? And is this your preferred method, and why? Yes, I have all, well, I will say I was a little bit more Socratic in the beginning, just like calling on people, you know. Um, and I used to be much more, um, like I would have a typed out lesson plan like minute to minute like because when Thorough. I first oh my goodness yes <laughs> and when I first started teaching I was, I was much more nervous and I felt mm -hmm. like I really needed to know exactly what I was doing at every single second in the class and you know I did that throughout my student teaching and then it you know it got easier and then as I've taught some of the classes I've taught at UTEP now are on their third or fourth time through um, like the class we're doing this semester, this is the second time in this particular version I've taught it. So I tweak things semester to semester. But the nice thing about getting to teach some classes kind of year, year to year is that I'll develop materials for that class. And then, you know, I have certain lectures that I've given a lot. <laughs> so I don't have to be quite so tied to my, you know, notes. I can, I can bring everybody into the discussion more because that is when people really learn, right? Is when they're engaged in the discussion. And so I think as, a, as every, as each year goes by, uh, discussion becomes more and more important to me because you don't, I mean, you may want me to stand up in front of the class and lecture at you at a, for an hour, 20 minutes, but I really don't think that you do, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that nobody in our class wants that because how boring is that for you? I mean, you only need me to give you, you know, the building blocks and then together we're going to build something with them right so i think that's why to me that's how learning happens right is by you doing it like us doing it together not by me talking at you right because activity is how how we make connections so as an english professor you've taught multiple courses and perhaps a course more than once when teaching it um, has there been an expectation when entering the dialogue or have students always interpreted things differently and what's it like entering dialogue as and English courses versus like other courses that you think? That's a good question. I guess I'll start with the like multiple qu multiple course. course part of that question. So there are some classes that I have taught almost every year that I've been at UTEP, like Chaucer, um, which is a single author class. And that class has evolved over the years. Um, I've kind of taken out some texts, kept some in. Um, but you know, it's really a Canterbury Tales class. And I can kind of count on certain reactions at certain points in the semester, but there's always going to be a new, a new take that I never expected. And so I, I also kind of, I hope for that as well. Like I, I can kind of count on some kind of standard reactions, but then I'm also always trying to come up with assignments that prompt people to maybe think about things in a way I haven't, you know, yet encountered because that is, that's growth for, for me, right? It helps me make the class better. Um, and, you know, every year that goes by, you know, Chaucer is, you know, somewhat known <laughs> in general culture. And so people are going to have um, different reactions, right? They're going to have thoughts about it. So th I think that can only enrich the conversation. Like literature, literary studies mm -hmm. versus, say, history mm -hmm. or, um, 
or music mm -hmm. or art or engineering, yeah. Um, I think that what it really all comes down to for us in, in literary studies is the text, right? That's what brings us together. We're readers. We are a, a community of, of readers and interpreters. Um, we're a textual community, to use um, a critical phrase from medieval studies, right? <laughs> the people who uh, come together around any particular given text at a particular moment in time. And so all of our discussions are going to be based off of, in response to, pushing back against, challenging, questioning the text that is the shared object of our study. And the really wonderful thing about that is that it's interpretive, right? Your reaction to any text is going to be connected to, but n not the same as mine. And that goes for every other person in the classroom, and yet we're all reading the same text. And that shared um, experience of, you know, of subjectivity an interpretation as an activity in common, but that nevertheless yields a different understanding for everybody, is the magic, right, of literature, of texts, of books, of why we're readers, right? It brings us together. Why choose medieval studies then? Oh, yes, because that <laughs> is a, a group or a time period of literature that most of my students haven't really encountered much before, right, in their literary studies, in their, in their wider journey of reading. And so if I can introduce them to something new that they haven't read, and then by extension, a time period, a culture, um, a type of literature that is new and exciting, then all the better. So I think, and to me, you know, I was always really fascinated by history and um, was always really interested in um, issues of gender and authorship. And so those things came together for me. What challenges as an educator did you anticipate when engaging in dialogue and what has been unexpected? Ooh, I think my biggest fear was always that no one would talk. Right, that I'd get in, <laughs> I'd get into the classroom and I'd say something that I like, talk about something that I think is really interesting, and then just like total crickets, right? <laughs> um, so, and that is a challenge, right? There have been moments where those fears were realized, right? And in fact, I was really excited to share, you know, X poem or whatever, or um, or you know, whatever the the case may be, and people just didn't really take to it, or hadn't done the reading, or were not excited about it that day, or. In my British literature survey class, I always have a day where we read like dirty poems, right? Full of like oh, sex I think and I remember yes, the disappointment and yes, <laughs> yeah, the the the, the um, <laughs> well, we don't need to get into it, right? <laughs> yes, but really graphic poems from the 17th century that people can hardly believe, you know, how how they detailed they are, and so that can be a real challenge. And it, you know, depending on the class, sometimes people just cannot wait to get into talking about the dirty poems, and other times it's just like. Oh, Nobody's geez. gonna talk. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a challenge for me to, um, from year to year, um, realize you never know which texts are gonna be the texts everybody wants to say something about, or which texts are just gonna shut down conversation. And so I have found that I have to be ready to jumpstart that conversation, that dialogue, if if it's kind of gone flat, or that we need to pivot, or that there I need to be able to. Th <laughs> I've always got to have a couple tricks in my back pocket, right? Of, how to, even if we're not going to have a big, robust conversation about it, take something away, right? Think about it in relationship to the other things we've read, even by simply asking the question, okay, well, why did I assign this since nobody really wants to talk about it? Let's talk about it from a, the perspective of our course syllabus. <laughs> why is it on here? Why did we read it after this and before that? Um, was it because of the author? Was it the content? You know, what is it that I want you to see? What do I want you to get out of this today? So sometimes we have to approach it from that, that point of view as well. So I think, excuse me, I think dialogue can be on the level of the text, but it can also be on the level of our pedagogical goals together, our learning, <laughs> our learning outcomes, right? <laughs> what, what we want to get out of having this class session on this text in this class, this semester in this class, which is about British literature to 1485 or women in literature or whatever it may be, yeah. How has your engagement with those texts kind of changed versus when you were reading it as a student? Yeah, teaching something ch changes it for you, right? Because um, I've realized that, you know, so like, so in my book, <laughs> um, you know, I have uh, it's five chapters and each chapter really goes in depth into like particular texts. Mm -hmm. So like Marjorie Kemp, which we read, I have a whole chapter on Marjorie Kemp, right? Um, far more, am I, I'm gonna say, you know, in my own work, my own scholarship, or when I was reading it as a student. You know, like line by line, I could say something about that text. But that's not how anybody reads a text for the first time. And in all of my classes, I have to remember that I'm introducing my students to a topic, to a text they may never have encountered before. And they need to understand 
what this is, why on earth are we reading it, <laughs> and what are the things that I need to look for. So I think about, I think that my job is to give you a roadmap, right, to, lit to older literature, right, and show you what that, what that horizon looks like, right? And then you can go do more with it if you want. And so I find that when I teach, I talk about a text from the perspective of like literary history, which is part of my job in the department. I'm the person that introduces you to the earliest stuff we're gonna read in English. So, you know, this for example, is the first autobiography in the English language, right? And that's important because it's the predecessor to this thing and that thing and the other thing that comes later. So I'm, I'm positioning um, the text that we read together in relationship to things you may already know about from later time periods. But then I'm also, it's also part of my job to introduce you to different types of literature because you, as readers, will become familiar with that landscape of literature and then, in turn, you will become writers of different types of texts too. So part of it is like, you know, we're looking at the past to see how that has shaped the present moment, but it's also pointing us towards what what's gonna come next, right? And you're all gonna participate in that. I like that, yeah, because um, when we've done like the assignments and stuff, I really like how, um, I really like how like there's no expectation for the conversation, but somehow like there'll be people, there be, will be students that will say something that I had and like how like there's shared thoughts and stuff like that. I just really like that it's a limited, like a limited um, lecture thing. And then like after that, it's just like, okay, everybody talk and we just all interact with each other. And you kind of have like a very minor, and you, uh, I guess minor role and you just kind of like help control and navigate the conversation. And I really like that because oh. it's very like, okay, like I'm actually learning. And it's very interesting to learn from other people's perspective because there'll be students that I'm like I n never would have thought that like I remember mm -hmm. in women in literature the I forgot what poem it was but everybody was like having like um like not contradicting statements but very like well I took it like this and I took it like mm -hmm. this and I find that very like invigorating um when you were like a st when you were a student in your class and you were like in your classes do you wish that you could kind of have like a classroom to yourself instead of just moving around like have like a set class so you can play like posters and stuff like that oh no actually i don't feel that way because now that we're so digital <laughs> i mean i use i mean i do powerpoint when i need and um you know for me, the classroom is the text, right? So it doesn't really matter, you know, the physical parameters. Um, what matters is that we've all read and we're all talking about the same thing that day. So yeah, I don't. I guess I don't worry about that so much now. Yeah. In terms of literature, does structure really matter when kind of en engaging with literature? You mean structure of like, like physical school, like structure? school, because you said. Do you mean like that it can kind of be? It's re regardless, regardless mm. of where it's at, can it still be consumed the same way? Well, that's. That's a trickier question. And so, you know, I've, I've had experimental days of taking my class outside, mm -hmm. say, or, or, you know, um, or of course during COVID, we were all online, not, a, not the way I learned to teach, right? And not the way I'm used to teaching. And so I actually think that I do appreciate like a classroom setting. It doesn't have to be the same classroom. It doesn't have to be the same style of classroom. Um, but I do think that having a shared space in which we have a place for us to all sit where we can look at each other and have our text with us that that really is valuable because there is also something about the physical parameters of a classroom that signals to our minds consciously and subconsciously right that now we're thinking together now we're having an intellectual <laughs> conversation right whether that's good or bad that's the the nature of institutional physical formats of places of learning and so i think it has power do you think, I guess, does it matter if it's a physical book or like a digital copy? Oh no, that's not a silly question. <laughs> that's a hugely important question, especially for me. Because, um, you know, when I, well, I mean, my goodness, I went to college, like there were no, there were no e-books when I went to college, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and so I remember, you know, sometimes I would even check books out of the library because they were expensive or, you know, return them at the end, you know, whatever. But now, right, And but, but you had to come with your book to class and I'll just never forget like, sitting there as an undergraduate, everybody flipping to the page, you know, reading it on the page together. There's a power in that. We're sharing that moment of, of a physical action that is also an intellectual process. And that is a hugely powerful unifying moment of, of shared intellectual community. And so I'm really torn about whether to allow, not allow, you know, e-books <laughs> in my classes. I allow them. Um, and, uh, 
to me, what matters most is that you've got the text, you've read the same text that the classmates have read, and that we can come to class prepared to talk about it and have that shared community of inquiry. I do kind of miss the days of the hard copy together, but I also realize that you, your generation, have a really different digital intellectual life than I do, right? And that, um, you know, you are reading things on the screen in a way that I never will. And that, who's to say that that's better or worse, right? You have a deeper relationship with that. So I've let go a little bit of my skepticism of it. Yay. And in, in most, in recent semesters, <laughs> I've said, you know, it doesn't matter as long as you've done the reading. Because that, ultimately, that's what matters, right? Like, whether we're flipping through it together or scrolling together, we have something to say about the same text that meant something different and in a kind of variable way, which raises questions for us, which we are gonna have shared humanistic inquiry about. And so I think that's what matters most. Thank you, Dr. Zerlis. You're very welcome, it was a pleasure. This has been Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, the student edition. My name is Jasmine Gracia. Please join us next time.